Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I wanted to welcome you to our webinar. Uh, we have a wonderful program uh, scheduled for today. We will start, like always, we'll try to start on time. I uh, just wanted to make uh, mention that next week, uh, unfortunately, there will be no class, so we will continue the week after. Uh, you'll get a reminder via uh, emails. And uh, also now you can find our uh, webinar online on YouTube. If you Google DAWA 101, you'll be able to find our webinars online. So, but however, please don't do that yet. Wait after this uh, uh, after this webinar. Okay, uh, this start session, now? Then you'll be able to. So I'm gonna hand over oh, to right. our I'm Imam who is gonna be I'm presenting. His I'm name is Imam Jawad, and Allah he's Allah going Allah to present. Allah 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 Allah. Say Bismillah. Imam Jawad, you're ready to go. Assalamu alaikum. Inshallah, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, we'll be talking about some principles of Dawa. One of the basic principles in terms of the etiquettes is to, there are certain prerequisites for a Dai, and Dai uh, also we need to know the audience and also how to engage in our audience. Um, one of the aspects of uh, Dawa is having open-ended questions and then uh, those open-ended questions lead us to a conversation and dialogue and um, we here at Y Islam have developed a skill called STRAW so we'll go over that also very quickly what STRAW stands for. So first of all some of the prerequisites that are important for a Dai if you want to give Dawa to others about Islam Number one, knowledge, uh, ilm, which is very essential. Um, even though the hadiths or Rasulullah Balluhani, whatever ayahs, talk about me, even if it's just one ayah, applies to all and everybody can give dawah. But it is a good idea to constantly increase our knowledge, uh, ilm, in terms of giving dawah. And then second thing, when it comes to giving dawah, a prerequisite that has to be is soft-hearted being tender, gentle, kindness, lean. Um, this is from the uh, ayah in the Quran, Surah Al Imran, Allah said about Prophet Muhammad It is from the mercy of Allah that you were kind and gentle to them. Had you been uh, stiff-hearted and hard-hearted, then, O oh Prophet, people would have run away from you. Third prerequisite is having wisdom, which means basically knowing your audience, their background, their culture, their values, giving examples to relate to them, uh, because if we do not relate to the target audience that we're talking to, then they would not be able to absorb the message we are delivering to them. And of course, when giving dawah, a lot of hurdles and obstacles come, a lot of issues come with the person who's listening and they might argue or debate. So patience or sabr is a very important prerequisite for a da'i and da'ya in order to engage in dawah. And what basically that means is that we do not lose our temper or cool or calmness. We try to listen more and not react to the person. And last but not the least, and very important, is morality or haya. Because if we are giving da'wah to others while we do not practice, obviously that would create confusion in the recipient and they would not be able to understand why is this dichotomy. Uh, just like Allah says in the Quran, This is in Surah Baqarah, Allah is saying that you uh, order other people with righteousness and piety and goodness while you um, uh, yourself you forget about it and you read the book you recite the book so obviously Allah over there is saying that there has to be conformity between character and behavior and whatever we are telling others to about it um, when it comes to the issue of knowing your audience we have to, of course relate to some American culture American lifestyle uh, cliches proverbs um, American uh, uh, we can say habits and things that we can give examples of in order for people to relate to it. Uh, like Allah said in the Quran that he did not send a messenger to people except in their lisan, uh, except in their tongue. So obviously uh, we have to 
master certain aspects such as analogy, use it as a tool, customize it, build on similarities between them. Because if we give them uh, uh, things Imam. from the outside of this country, Imam example Jawad. from Middle East or Africa or Asia, it wouldn't connect with them. So the whole aspect of knowing your audience is to connect with your audience, relate to them. Uh, think of, you know, we've been living here in America for a lot of time, so we can understand many of the culture and traditions and values of American lifestyle and the American culture and try to use that, uh, you know, uh, occasions and celebrations and whatnot have you in this country. So that builds with your audience a rapport and rapport is very important. Another aspect is that we have to drive the conversation, meaning when it comes to giving dawa, if we were yeah, just Imam listening Jawad. and the other person was talking, Jawad. that's really not Dawa, that's like passive Dawa. Proactive Dawa is where we are engaging with the person, we're driving the conversation, we're asking questions, understanding their answers and concerns, and then uh, likewise relating to them and giving them. So one of the uh, golden rule of uh, giving Dawa is that whenever a person asks a question, we don't just simply answer that. Yes, brother. Hello. No, go ahead, continue, sorry. Can you all see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, we can see your screen. Can you continue? Okay. Thank you. So. so one of the important aspects of uh, Dava is finding an opportunity in the dialogue and conversation. Um, whatever the question the person may have asked us, uh, we should find an opportunity to connect with them and uh, connect any aspect of the Islamic belief system, the tenets, the practices, the rituals, you know, the five pillars of Islam or the articles of faith. Um, that is one of the ways of engaging with the person. Um, another good way of a skill set of Dawa is to start off with the person that, what do you know about Islam? Open-ended questions always help us Open-ended questions always help us in understanding the mindset, the psyche of the person, what they are thinking, you know, what they know already about Islam, what they don't know, where are they at. And so basically it helps uh, us, the Dai, to build a conversation, a dialogue from the amount of knowledge. If somebody tells us, I don't know anything about Islam, then you know you can start from scratch. Let's say you say, ask somebody, what do you know about Islam? They say, oh, yeah, I know Ramadan, I know fasting, or I know that black box over there in Saudi Arabia. So it gives you an idea if the person has some uh, background information about Islam and its practices and rituals, and you can use that to build up on it, inshallah. Um, because these open-ended questions uh, help stir some kind of curiosity in the person. Remember, brothers and sisters, Dawa is all about creating curiosity in the mind of the person. We are not here to guide anybody. We cannot convert anybody. Guidance is in the hands of Allah. Allah is the one who guides people. Uh, and we are only to deliver the message. Hence, we have to deliver the message in such a way that it creates some kind of curiosity and thirst for truth in the heart and mind of the person. Once that curiosity is created because of our skills and tips and strategies that we use to talk to the person, to converse with them, to dialogue with them, that curiosity will then lead them in the search for truth. If you remember the uh, story of the Sahabi Salman al-Farisi, who came from the Persian Empire. You know, his story is very amazing because his story is really about the search of truth. He was searching and searching and his search for truth 
led him all the way to come from Persia all the way to Medina and he camped over there and was waiting uh, for the prophet to come and then he you know this whole his whole story shows how his curiosity of what is really the truth uh, helps him reach a certain and from experience of people who have converted to Islam I can tell you from experience majority of the people who have developed curiosity in their minds and hearts um, to find the truth and and nothing but the truth they then settle down on it and and, and find peace and find uh, tranquility in Islam now there's a code a mnemonic code that we have uh, developed uh, uh, in why Islam which is called straw now let me allow me to explain to you what uh, that refers to um, S stands for Salat al-Mustaqim or the straight path. The reason we came up with straw is because straw is a tool, a device with which you consume fluids or drinks into your mouth. Now obviously you have to suck onto a straw and, and therefore you then actively uh, digest that material that you are sucking into and comes into your mouth. So basically that whole philosophy of straw is, is where the person, the non-Muslim, is desiring the truth and they would uh, use this to consume or to absorb the information of Islam. Hence, it's easy to remember the straw strategy uh, because everybody uses straw in their daily life and it clicks in the mind. Now, how does it come up with, uh, you can use this strategy anywhere in your Dawa field, whether you're giving Dawa face to face at a Dawa booth or talking with your colleagues or friends anywhere at work or over phone even. So therefore, um, I'll explain how we develop this strategy based on the Quran and Sunnah. Uh, so obviously the S stands for the straight path, which is the end goal of this, the straw, or the end goal of any da'wah or dialogue is to come on to the Surat al-Mustaqim. And how do we reach Surat al-Mustaqim as a straight path? is through T-R-A-W. Now T stands for Tawheed, R stands for Risala, which is the messenger of the Prophet and A stands for Akhirah. And the way we know about Tawheed, Risala, Akhirah, T-R-A, is through Wahi, revelation. Uh, Wahi connects all three together. Now you may be wondering why we're only talking about three things, Tawheed, Risala, Akhirah. What about the other aspects of Islam? See, if people are in a rush, people are in a hurry, and they have not, don't have time, and, and at least you want to give the basic information, you want to at least start off with the basic three tenets of Islam, which is the belief in one God, Tawheed, and the belief in the messenger of universality of Prophet Muhammad, that he's the prophet for all mankind and all people, and also to believe in life after that. Now, the way we develop this is through the seer of Rasulullah and also from the Quran. If you look at the Makki surahs in the Quran, they are short and concise, straightforward verses. And majority of the focus in the Makki surahs and Makki verses of the Quran are on three major aspects. Belief in one God, Tawheed, the messengership of Rasulullah, that he's a prophet for all mankind, not just the Arabs. And also to drive the recipient to the concept of life after death, that there's accountability, there's questioning. Also, in the 13 years that Prophet Muhammad lived in Mecca and he was giving da'wah, his main focus was Tawheed, Risal, and Akhirah, TRA. And he did not talk about Salah, Psalm, Zakat, those things were not even revealed. So that shows that Allah wants, wanted to build in the people the concept of Iman and faith. And for that, these three were the essential components, essential pillars. Uh, to bring people to the concept that there is only one God, no partner, no association, to make the people realize that Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger and he has been sent for everybody, for all mankind, and to make people realize that this life is short and everybody's going to die, it's only temporary life, and the real life is a life after death, and for that life we have to work hard from this life in order to achieve that akhirah. And Wahi or revelation of God is the connector or the means through which we find out Tawheed, Risal, and Akhirah. So basically, this way we are able to deliver to the person in a compact, concise way the basic message. And obviously, if the person has more time, we can then 
from here, uh, the springboard and launching pad from here, we can elaborate more on the other aspects like belief, you know, in the angels of God, belief in the uh, books of God, the scriptures, you know, belief in fate and predestination. And then, you know, the five pillars of Islam, what Muslims do, what they don't do, and all those things. So that is very important to understand. Um, okay. Now, one of the aspects is to steer Dawah conversation. Let's say somebody asked you a question about hijab. You know, why Muslims wear, Muslim women, why do they wear this thing on their head? Now, if you, if we answer them and just simply, oh, it's for modesty, morality, it is for chastity, it's for, you know, piety and all that. That's a simple, you know, basic answer for the question. But if we... Um, power pack our answer and embed in the answer on a hijab and try to connect it to one of the uh recital or akhirah so that will be a, a a different strategy of giving the answer where we are answering the question of the person the questioner in such a way that we are luring them or enticing them or attracting them or directing them to the three basic beliefs uh, of Islam, which is Tawheed, Risa'ah, and Akhirah. So therefore, how would we do for hijab? Let's say somebody asks a question, you know, why Muslim women cover their head, or what is that called? We say that's hijab, and they cover, the reason they cover that, because that is a show of their um, allegiance to God, because God is the one who ordered us. So the concept of Tawheed comes in that, you know, so he, it's not just something abstract or theoretical that I just believe in one God. I have to show that belief in one God in my actions, in my attire. So if God has ordained me to cover my hair, um, I'm talking about a woman. So therefore, I have to show that in my action that I believe in that one God and I honor his commandment and I honor and respect him by, uh, and my, uh, by covering my hair. And the second thing is I am following the Risala, the messenger of Rasulullah, because Prophet Muhammad peace upon him told his wives and his, all the Muslim women to cover their hair. So I'm following the Sunnah or I'm, I am adhering, attesting to the fact that I firmly believe in the messengership of Prophet Muhammad because he is the one who uh, or, or advise people on the pretext of the ordainment from God. So you bring in Tawheed, you bring in Risala. And then the third aspect you bring in this question is, look, the reason I do this is because I believe in life after death. I believe in Akhirah. And I know that I will be questioned on the day of judgment that in the Quran, there was an order to cover your hair, or the hijab, and why didn't you do it? So because of my fear of accountability, or at least my uh, earning desire to meet God on the day of judgment, so I know I will be questioned, hence I do that as a practice. Uh, because a lot of times people say, well, I see a lot of Muslim women not practicing hijab. Why do you practice hijab? So I mean, just like this, uh, you can explain to them that, look, those who are not practicing Muslims, they may be lacking in some uh, aspects of their belief system, or they may not have that firm um, commitment to Tawheed, to Risala, or their linkage and bondage to God and to the Messenger of Allah, Prophet Muhammad, or they don't have that uh, desire to meet their Lord as earnestly as much as anyone else who does that. So this is just one example of hijab, how you can steer the conversation in such a way that you're connecting them to the three basic tenets of Tawheed, Risala, and Akhira. Likewise, you can do for anything uh, in, in Islam, any of the other aspects that we have, inshallah. Now, sometimes we get into a brawl, we get into an argument with people, you know, they might counter argue or counter with you with a lot of things and back and forth in dawah. One thing is very important, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, is that we have to avoid saying negative things of other religions. We should never um, uh, insult or humiliate or demoralize people's faith, people's practices. We should never mock at them or have sarcasm or make fun of that. Just like Allah says in the Quran, Surah Anam, Do not... Uh, curse the people who call upon besides God uh, because they will then curse Allah in uh, animosity and hatred so by us uh, degrading their gods even don't say like oh you are a statue worshiper idol worshiper or you worship uh, 
non living things, things like that. So avoiding that and acknowledging that they, everybody has a right to choose their belief system. Nobody can be forced. And you can bring in the ayah from the Quran, Surah Baqarah, that Allah said, La din, that there is no compulsion in Islam, there's no force in Islam and anything, because uh, truth is very clear and apparent from falsehood. So therefore, we can always uh, try to build on that, that look, we are only here delivering the message. We're not forcing anybody to believe in all of this. And very important thing when we are dealing with conflict is to build on similarities between the people, build on similarities between the faith, rather than pointing out differences, because pointing out differences creates rancor and jealousy and hatred. And therefore, it doesn't really help uh, dawah. Dawah is all about softness, tenderness, gentleness, kindness. Dawah is all about uh, attracting the person, you know, with a smiling face, facial expressions count, you know, bodily expressions count. If you just go back to the prophetic dawah system that Rasulullah had in Mecca or Medina, he used to attract people. He was like a magnet. People got attracted to him. Even though they did all kinds of atrocities and torture to him, they were aggressive to him but never ever did he retaliate or seek revenge. And he always acknowledged the good in the people and tried to bring them through the good into the truth of Islam. So that is very important that we deliver the message in such a nice manner, a nice way that the person feels attracted uh, to the religion itself, um, very important. And uh, obviously there are some tough questions in Islam, you know, you can, uh, the, they can be answered through um, uh, what you call wisdom and uh, using that same concept. A lot of times they will ask you these tough questions just to deviate you or you know uh, dis distract you or sidetrack you from the real thing. But remember, we have to bring them to the straw, you know, to the the, the, the strategy and the tactic. Um, every organization has their own, you know, IRA has GORAP, so if somebody's comfortable with that, they can do that. Um, other organizations have theirs. Uh, we we really want to focus on Tawheed, Risal, and Akhra in the beginning part of the person talking to us so that they are able to understand the value and importance. Uh, because for 13 years in Mecca, uh, time and again, Rasulullah was just pounding on one thing, you know, Tawheed, oneness of God, no association, no partners, messengership of Rasulullah that he is a prophet for all mankind, like Allah said in Surah Araf, Surah 7. Say, oh human beings, I am a prophet of Allah to all of you. Because the common misconception people have or perception they have is that Prophet Muhammad is just a prophet for Arabs or prophet for Muslims only. He's not a prophet for other people. But in fact, Allah has said in the Quran very clearly in this ayah that I just recited that he is a prophet to all mankind. So he's a prophet to the Americans, to the Europeans, to the Australians, African, Asians, Chinese, everybody. And it is our job, our responsibility to deliver that messenger of Rasulullah that he's a prophet for you. And he relates to you, even though he came in Arabic and Quran was in Arabic, but the Quran has been translated to many different languages. So it's 925. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, and if somebody has any questions, we can take questions. I'll leave the slide on this straw strategy. Okay, Zakalah Khair. Um, <clears throat> let me see. Okay, so if you inshallah, if you have any questions, uh, please post your questions in the question section. Uh, Sheikh, uh, can, you address, can, you, can you address? Can you hear me? Iman Jawad, can you hear me? You're welcome, Salam. So, yeah, uh, you're not able to hear me on the microphone. So I'm going to ask you a question here on, on the Why don't you, I think you put yourself on mute. Why don't you open yourself? If you unmute no, I'm not. yourself. Uh, okay. Can anyone else hear me? Yeah, the, the, the audience can hear me as well. So the question, uh, first question is, 
uh, what happens when you are talking to someone about Islam and they become belligerent? What, what should you do at that time? The first question I've been told is that if somebody talks about Islam and they become belligerent, how do you deal with them? Uh, like I said in my presentation, we deal with them with calmness and politeness, smile. Um, of course, if it's going to such a case where it's going to become very, very provocative, then obviously we can uh, we can we can say peace and, and, and move out of that situation because we don't want to get physical or we don't want to get in any kind of situation where be, where the dialogue conversation becomes a fight. But obviously we can tell the person who, who is getting belligerent that look, um, we're not here to fight each other. We're not here to argue with each other. We're just trying to you know reason and understand with each other. And I mean no harm to you, and therefore, you know, it should not bring in Satan between us and try to get fighting. Why can't we just have civilized conversation between the two of us? And by using all these strategies and calmness and smile and coolness and showing them, look, you're getting hyper, your voice is racing up, you're yelling and shouting and screaming at me, but I'm not. So by making that person realize that you are calm and cool while they are not, uh, you try to calm them down. But if they still don't and they're adamant about it, then you can always walk away. Just like the ayah in the Quran, Allah says, And when the ignorant people address them, they say peace or they move out of there in order to cool things down. Next okay, question. Zakhla khay. Zakhla khay. Thank you. Um, so also someone wanted to know, can you please explain uh, what you mean by pairing up? Brother, to brother, you know, like when I guess when you're giving dawa, uh, you should go in pairs. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> no, by pair I mean like if a brother is giving dawa, it's better that they give it to a male instead of a female, in order to avoid the fitna and all that. But yes, a person can also uh, give the dawa to the women, also not Muslim women, but they have to be conscious about not letting shaitan come in between and not sidetrack from a dawah conversation to some other kind of conversation which may be, you know, considered as uh, immodest or immoral. So it's better for a female, for a Muslim sister to give dawah to a non-Muslim woman and for a Muslim brother or male to do a male non-Muslim. But if circumstances need be and necessitate that a person has to talk to the opposite gender, then it is fine. But at the same time, they should constantly remind themselves and, you know, recite istighfar in their heart, in their mind, so that shaitan doesn't come in between the conversation uh, to lure them to something else other than dawah. Okay, thank you. And and this is a big question and, and sort of related because of the timing. Uh, nowadays, especially with the holidays are coming up, uh, how do you channel these questions, you know, about Thanksgiving and Christmas and things of that nature? Uh, how do you channel that politely uh, in, in, in the form of a dawah conversation? Um, you mean the questions about Thanksgiving, Christmas and all that holidays, how to yes. channel that to dawah? Yes, sir. If someone is asking, you know, what, what's your plans for Thanksgiving? Uh, you know, what you're going to be doing for Christmas kind of thing. So. <clears throat> how, how do Thanksgiving you, how do you... is very easy. Thanksgiving is giving thanks to Allah SWT. So um, we do not celebrate Christmas or Thanksgiving as per se. So we do not have a specific uh, plan for that. But yeah, allow me please to explain to you what is the concept of thankfulness in, in Islam. And then from there, you can start off a dialogue conversation with the person that the real thing we give or the real way to give thanks to God is on a daily basis and not once in a year. And therefore, we, we don't in Islam, we do not focus much on rituals. We'd rather focus on the spirituality of the worship and everything has to be taken as a form of worship and therefore you, you connect that to the concept of Tawheed, that look, we take whatever worship we have or whatever celebrations or occasions we have or rituals we have, it is ordained by God. God has revealed that in his revelation, the Quran, which is the Holy Scripture of God, the last divine message. 
of God to mankind, and then you connect it to also the Risala, uh, Messenger of Rasulullah, that we practice and observe whatever the Prophet Muhammad told us to practice, and that is what the Sunnah means or following his path means. Anything that he did, we do it. Anything he did not do, we stay away from. So therefore, we are more connected to our Prophet Muhammad, uh, even though we don't see him or we did, we did not see him, we don't meet him, but we are connected through our love and commitment and uh, for the Prophet Muhammad. Hence, we do um, practices of worship, what he has left behind for us. So if there is something that he has not, uh, celebrating birthdays of any Prophet, uh, is, is not permissible and regardless of the rituals that the world practices in December or, or November, our job is to focus on true worship, which is to increase a person in their spiritual um, desire and learning towards God. Um, main thing we need to focus uh, in this kind of a dialogue about holiday seasons and all that is that what is the purpose of all these rituals? What's the purpose of all these practices? What's the underlying principle and factor? You know, if the person is scratching their head and they can't answer, you tell them, well, according to Islam, the main underlying principle for all these things is connection to God. You know, we are here on this earth. We need a connection with God. So connection with God or the real purpose of any worship uh, for that matter in life, is to have a strong bond and relationship with God. You should feel the spirituality, feel the warmth and sweetness of faith in your heart, in your soul, in your mind, just like the Quran tells us and just like the Prophet Muhammad uh, alluded to it, that the sweetness of faith is in terms of your connectivity with God. So we should ask ourselves that what brings us closer and closer to God and we should practice that. And it has to be justified or proven through revelation or wahi, you know, like so whatever is mentioned through the Quran or through the Prophet's words, that is automatically proven as something substantial that we do practice. So at the same time, we are not against this. I mean, you are practicing, you're most welcome. But we as a Muslim do not practice these things. Uh, we rather focus on spirituality of giving thanks all around the year, every day, all around the day and night. And there are many ways that we give thanks. In fact, we can connect here with certain verses of giving thanks in the Quran that Allah SWT has given. So that will bring a, a kind of food for thought for the person receiving the message so that they can uh, explore the Quran. You know, we can even project to them that, you know, have you looked at this verse in the Quran or that verse about giving thanks to God? Or have you looked at this verse about Jesus, the reality of Jesus in during the December month, instead of talking about Christmas and Santa Claus, we can talk about the miraculous birth of Jesus mentioned in the Quran, the miracles of Jesus mentioned in the Quran, the purpose of Jesus, why did he come in the first place? What was his goal and motive? And so the, the, the direction of the conversation can always be steered towards something fruitful and meaningful and relating it to the verses in the Quran. Obviously for that, somebody has to do an extra homework, like around Thanksgiving time, homework they need to do is to know on their fingertips the verses that talk about uh, thankfulness in the Quran, like in Surah Ibrahim, Allah says, If you give thanks to Allah, then he will increase you many, many fold. Um, there's another verse, it talks about uh, Prophet David, Dawud al-Islam, so that connects to the biblical prophets. And look, the Quran is also talking about a biblical prophet. And the ayah over there, it says, A'malu ala Dawud al-Shukra, O family of David, show your thankfulness in action. Uh, in in their in physically through actions that you are thankful to God, uh, so these things can be related into a nice dialogue conversation during this time. Zakhlaq, thank you. Um, another question is, how would you uh, introduce the straw method into a conversation? Well, this straw method is basically for you, the dai or daya. It is not to relate to the, it's a tool given to the volunteers or given to the dai or dai or the, the person giving dawah to start a dialogue or to 
uh, to start a conversation and, and give that in, in, in a systematic, you know, organized fashion. It is not there to explain to the non-Muslim what is straw, what is tea, what is R, what is A. Rather, you are developing and you're organizing your chain of thoughts, your words, your um, uh, speaking power in such a way that you have a systematic way of going from one aspect to another. So that is what the purpose of this is, that you start off, you have a launching pad, you have a starting point to talk to somebody. Uh, because a lot of times, uh, new volunteers or new dais, when they come into the field, they're like blanks. They're like, oh, what should I talk about? You know, how should I give dawah? Where should I start about Islam? Um, I get a lot of questions, you know, Imam, tell me, well, if I want to start dawah, what should be the first thing I talk to them? So this strategy helps people develop and organize themselves in such a way that they have a starting point to start off with. And then from here, they can further elaborate and expand on the other aspects of Islam, uh, especially the six articles of faith, because in this, we already have three articles of faith here, you know, life after death, akhirah, risala, messenger of Rasulullah, and yastub, and tawheed. So the other three can be also added on here. Thank you, sir. Um, the question is for me to give da'wah in an, um, like how much, someone wants to know how much knowledge they should have to be able to give da'wah. Um, basic minimum is to at least know about the five pillars of Islam and the six articles of faith, belief in Allah, belief in the prophets of God, belief in the books of Allah, belief in the um, angels, belief in uh, life after death, and belief in fate and predestination. And then the concept, the first pillar of Islam, shahada, what it means, uh, what is shahada itself, the basic conviction and the belief of Allah and the message of Rasulullah and the proclamation of faith. Then the second pillar and the uh, salah, and then the third pillar, siyam, fasting, fourth pillar, zakat, and the fifth pillar, hajj. So if somebody is well versed in these um, six and five, eleven things, that is at least a starting point for them. Because if they are not aware of these say, these eleven things and somebody asks the questions, they'll be blank and they'll be like puzzled and confuse how to answer that. So that is a bare minimum basic thing. Uh, going more in deep in in depth of this knowledge, that is extra for the person. And they can, like I said in the earlier part of my presentation, that some of the prerequisites for a dai, one of them is to constantly seek knowledge, constantly read books, watch videos, you know, listen to lectures, constantly enhance their knowledge of Islam and by through a variety of means today in the social media and the technological era there is no bars and no hurdles in uh, enhancing a person's knowledge in a wide spectrum of things. Zakallah khair, thank you. Um, yeah. Last question is, um, let me see. You can, you can hear my answers, right? The other people yeah. in the yeah. audience? Yes, yeah, uh, sir. Everybody uh, can hear your answer. Alhamdulillah. Uh, and the last question is, um, again, it, it's how do you address this uh, idea of uh, Thanksgiving? I mean, what's wrong with it? Why should Muslim celebrate Thanksgiving? It's a ritual. It's a practice. And uh, for us, like I said earlier in the answer to the question, for us, everything is mandated through the Sunnah or Prophet Muhammad. So, so um, because thanksgiving is like a worship a spiritual thing so it has to be something that is in line with the practices of prophet muhammad and his followers if they haven't done that but yes if somebody wants to look at it from a secular point of view just an abstract way of uh, you know giving thanks to god and that's a separate thing again the reason we explain to them that we don't worship or we don't uh, practice that is because it's not part of our worship but rather we give thanks uh, all around the year uh, as an american muslim living in this country uh, when it comes to the aspects of religious worships and all that we have to confirm to the two basic sources uh, of of law in islam which is the quran and the hadith uh, but uh, when it comes to any other traditional things like, you know, 
4th of July, celebrating 4th of July, going to see fireworks. That's nothing to do with religion or any spirituality or worship. So that's a separate thing. But when it comes to Thanksgiving or Halloween or Christmas, that is the religious aspect attached to it. There's a, a religious uh, paradigm to it. So therefore, practicing that or celebrating that or you know following that would give a skewed message to people in terms of um, the concept of Tawheed that on one side we say we believe in the oneness of God but if God has not ordained that thing in such a way then we are showing contradiction in our belief system. Bazakallah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention um... There, why Islam actually has a presentation on YouTube about uh, Thanksgiving in, in Islam. Uh, it, it's by uh, one of the sheikhs from Canada. It's a very good presentation. It's only about 10 minutes long, and I posted it in the uh, question and answer for everyone if they wanted to go and look at it, inshallah. Uh, sheikh, uh, people wanted to know as well, I'll finish with this, is if they can have your uh, copy of your presentation, if you can... Uh, Maybe send it to me, and they can, um, or if you wanted to put up your email address on the screen, so they can uh, uh, request it from you. Up to you. Yeah, I can send that presentation. It's going to be fifty dollars a piece, so whoever yeah. can. All pay right. That. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. good. So, it's not going. That fifty dollars is not going to me. It's going to White Slam. So we need there to generate you know, funds for that. Yeah, donation. If you can donate to White Slam. Uh, but again, that's just suggestive. I'm just joking. <laughs> well, I can hey, give it to you for free. Inshallah, I'll send it to you, Azad, and you can send it to all of them, Inshallah. Okay, thank you. And, if, and, if, if you, and it's, it's very simple. If you want to request from me, it's just my first name, Jawad at whiteslam.org. So you can just send me an email at Jawad at whiteslam, J A W A D at whiteslam.org, and I'll email it back to you. And I want to just take this opportunity for all these 104 people I see right now. See, we are constantly in need of volunteers, um, especially on the hotline. Our YSAM hotline is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And since I'm managing the hotline, you know better, brothers, that we're always constantly looking for volunteers. So even if you are a novice or an apprentice or a newcomer in Dawa, uh, we will train you, we'll recruit you. So if you want to volunteer sometime, the reason the hotline is so attractive, you don't have to go outside in the mall, in the parking lot or in a park or somewhere to you know, talk to somebody about Islam. You could be sitting in the comfort of your own home you could be lying on your bed or on your, sitting on your couch and a phone rings, you pick up the phone, you say, thank you for calling White Slam, how can I help you? Somebody asks you a question and voila, you're giving Dawa on the phone. So, and you give at your own flexible hours from the comfort of your home or even wherever you wanna be. So, because it's all a computer-based uh, PBX system. So, the calls are routed from the computer from New Jersey to your cell phone. So if any of you are interested in volunteering on the hotline, again, just send me an email and we'll take it from there, jawad.yslam.org. Thank you, Zakhlaq. I sent your email to everyone. Uh, okay, inshallah, if you can finish up with a closing uh, dua, inshallah, we'll end. Zakhlaq. Okay, my yeah, good inshallah. So we'll start with the dua. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi la akhirati hasana wa fi la ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إتنا وهب لنا من دونك رحمة إنك تحب اللهم تقبل منا إنك أنت سميع عليم وتوب علينا وعلينا إنك أنت رحيم وصلى الله على خلق محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم رحمة رحمين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله نستغفرك ونتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته عليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته